By round of applause, let's just have a gauge. How's everyone's major fair going so far? seen drones crash into each other today. Oh. Quite a few. Those who haven't, seriously, get out and check. There are some incredible things going on. It is an amazing event. Welcome to Maker Fair 2016. If it's your first time being here, welcome. If you've been here for years, welcome back. This is an incredible event, one that is of global proportions. As you can hear over the Australian accent, this reaches all over the, all over the world and is such an important day. Uh, to give you background, my name is Greg Wright. I host a live late night talk show for science and tech called The Tomorrow Show. We've taken the mentality of Conan, all of the late night talk shows, Ed Carson, Letterman, and translated it into a late night talk show for science and tech. So if that's something you like the sound of, please check out The Tomorrow Show. Also, I'm a contestant on America's Greatest Makers and here to do a little bit of promotion for that. Anyone who wants to build a product and possibly take it to market on someone else's dollars, go and sign up at Intel. America's Greatest Makers is casting season two. You'll get cash to build your product. You have a one in five chance, like five people will get $100,000 and the ultimate winner will get $1 million. So check that out. Massive day. I'm only up here to say hello to everybody and to introduce a guy who you're going to have an absolute blast with. You can see the picture up on the screen. I used to own one of these. It's going to be an incredible presentation on predicting the future. A tail, cheeseburgers and smartphones. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please give a massive round of applause for Will Smith. I actually talked a little bit about the history of technology. And we're not going to start with the hand axe, um, although I'm sure there's somebody here that can teach you how to nap flint and make your own uh, with some really bloody knuckles along the way. We're not going to talk about fire, steam engines, cars, um, let's see, hold on. next one, airplanes, uh, moon landing. We're going to start in a really important year for me. It's 1975. Why is 1975 important? Well, it's the year I was born. So, uh, I asked my parents about technology in our home in 1975, and, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of digital technology in our home at all. We didn't have no digital technology. It was all analog. We had a television, a microwave oven that had a mechanical timer, uh, a te one telephone. Fast forward 10 years and things had not really changed that much. We had an analog TV. We got three channels. You had to watch whatever was on. Uh, we had two of these telephones. We had, this is the, this is the microwave oven. It had a dial in the plate when you actually turned it up and down and it set, it set the timer. But we did have the beginnings of digital technology in our home by then. We had this. This was a digital AM FM clock radio. I got one for my 10th birthday. I asked for this as a birthday present. And it was the first thing that came into our house that had digital technology, that had microchips. Um, I had one of these. I had a, a, a pocket calculator, which, you know, in 1985, this was the extent of computing in, our, in my home. And it's kind of funny now, when I look back, because I wasn't allowed to use it when I was in school. Because uh, well, my teacher said that I wouldn't have a phone, uh, have a calculator on me every day. So, good job, Mrs. Stickley. She was wrong. Uh, fast forward another 10 years to 1995. This is, uh, this is, I was in college, this is my dorm room. I had a 16-bit game console, I had a digital microwave oven that had all sorts of programmable stuff that I really never used, and the mechanical one would have worked just as fine. Uh, and I had this, this was a personal computer, it was connected to the internet, and it was massively more powerful than all the stuff that was in my home in 1985. Um, so what had happened in those 10 years? Well, slowly and quietly, something had been happening with the density and the price of microchips. So, you know, the number of circuits on a chip was increasing year after year after year. And, and what does that really do? Well, you know, the more circuits that are on a chip, the more math the chip can do. And the more math the chips could do, the more capable the computers became. This is Gordon Moore. He was one of the founders of Intel. And I know some people are probably nodding their heads now. But in the 60s, he observed 
that the density of chips, of circuits on a microprocessor was doubling every year, year and a half to two years eventually. Um, at the same time, the price was halving every year. So it turns out that this is a big deal, and we ended up calling it Moore's Law. It's kind of starting to fail now, but, you know, who knows if that'll stick. They've said that a few times in the past. Um, how is that important today? Well, this, this is an iPhone success. It was released last year. Probably a lot of you have phones that are very similar to this in your pocket. Maybe you have more Android in this crowd than iPhones, I would bet. Um, but it came out almost 30 years after this guy. This, if you have never seen one before, is a prey to supercomputer. So in 1985, when I was 10 years old, this represented the absolute pinnacle of computing. It was the fastest computer that money could buy. It cost millions of dollars, and you pretty much had to build a building around it. So you had, it needed all sorts of special cooling, it needed the same power. It actually, all those metal bits sunk into cooling fluid that was non-conductive and that boiled at the operating temperature of the computer so that it wouldn't catch on fire. It was a pretty incredible device. Um, now, the question I'm going to ask you is how does the Cray 2 compare to the iPhone 6 that I have in my pocket right now? Does anybody want to just throw out some numbers? Like, anybody have any guesses? Okay, go ahead. That's a good guess, but actually it's uh, 60 is the number that you, that's important here. And it's not that 60 iPhones equals one Cray 2, it's that 60 Cray 2s equals one iPhone 6S. My daughter really liked it. <laughs> um, it's, it's incredible because in 30 years, something that was a million dollar machine that needed a building around it, basically became a thing that we just carry around our pocket and use to post pictures on the internet and share things with our family and, and you know, like, like cat pictures on Instagram. Now, before we go into why the Cray 2 and the iPhone play in the future, I want to talk about this guy right here. It's, it's a cheeseburger. Um, one of my favorite blog posts of all time is by this guy named Waldo Jacobith, and he wanted to make a cheeseburger from scratch. So he said, okay, I'm going to go out, I'm going to grow some lettuce and tomatoes, I'm going to make my own buns, I'm going to grind my own beef, and I'm going to make my own cheese. And that was an interesting exercise, but when he was done with it, he realized that he hadn't really made the cheeseburger from scratch. Because if he really wanted to do that, then he would have to have one of these, or actually two or three of these, depending on whether he wanted the cheese or not. Um, this is a dairy cow. He'd need this to make the cheese. He'd need another beef cow to slaughter and make the beef. He'd need something else to make bread in so that he could make the cheese. Uh, he'd need to grow his own wheat and mill it himself. And, and basically, there was this incredibly complex, multi-year effort to make one cheeseburger. Um, and he, he realized that even if he had done all that, then there was a bigger problem. Stuff is ready at different times of the year that goes into a cheeseburger. So your lettuce is ready in the springtime. Your tomatoes are ready at the end of summer and the fall. You usually slaughter cows in the fall or winter, so you don't have to pay for food for them all winter. You just want to make beef out of them. And he realized that at this point, it's a really impractical food that we can basically only have. You know, the reason we can go to McDonald's and get a $5 Big Mac anytime we want is that we live in a post agrarian society. So what that means is that instead of it being my responsibility to get food for myself and my family, and your responsibility to get food for yourself and your family, we all just distribute that work across millions of people, and we trust them to do their part so we can go to Safeway and get a TV dinner on a Thursday night. Now, it turns out that cheeseburgers are a lot like smartphones. We'll get to that in a second. But first, I want to talk about these guys. These are MP3 players. So, in the early 2000s, MP3 players were incredibly popular because, you know, all of a sudden we went from a thing that you know, we had to put a disc in or a tape in to a device that would hold thousands of songs and let's put it in our pocket and carry it around. If you like music, MP3 players were a huge deal, but there were some unexpected consequences about the popularity and low cost of these devices. Um, this is the only boring chart in the talk I'm giving. I apologize for it. But it's interesting because it's the price of memory uh, per megabyte from 2003 to 2015. And you notice something happens right around there. Um, that's when the iPod Nano came out. It was the first iPod that used flash memory instead of a hard drive. And it's important because it was so wildly popular and Apple knew they were going to sell so many of them that they ordered all of the memory in the world and drove prices of flash memory down. And once it was down, it stayed down. And it's been you know, virtually free from this point on. At the same time, laptops were really popular. And laptops used to be batteries. MP3 players use batteries. They all use the same technology battery, lithium-ion battery. And because of the popularity of these devices and the scale in which they were selling, 
all of a sudden, energy density in batteries, the price of those batteries was going way, way down. And because the laptops had screens, that had some interesting side effects too. This is an HGTV. Laptops, HGTVs, phones all use the same basic LCD screens. It's a common technology, and manufacturers make them by the square feet. They come off these enormous sheets and they cut them to basically fit the device that they want to put through them. The rise of HGTVs drove the density, pixel density of those screens and the price of those screens, pixel density up and price down. While all that was happening, some other stuff was happening. The internet got really, really popular. Um, the processors that make the internet work, that make the routers and access points that we all use to connect to the internet and that shuttle traffic back and forth around the world, run on these really low cost, kind of underpowered arm processors for a long time. But because we were selling so many of them, because of Moore's Law, those chips were becoming more and more capable as time went on, until all of a sudden, they were capable of general purpose computing. So, Flash memory got cheap, screens got cheap and big, uh, uh, ARM processors got cheap, and all of a sudden we have this, the smartphone. All of these things combined to make this an inexpensive, mass producible device that we all kind of just take for granted. Let me tell you, people love smartphones. Um, you know, we use them to communicate with each other, post pictures, uh, play games, read books, watch movies, a million things that you don't even think of anymore. Make reservations, find out how to get here today. Um, and by the end of this year, there's going to be something like, oh, wrong side. Um, the interesting thing about what's inside the smartphones, actually, is the components. We use them for all these things. There's a million components inside these phones that are really exciting and really interesting. And because of the enormous scale of the devices, uh, they've gotten cheap. At the end of this year, there's going to be something like 2 billion smartphones in pockets. That's an unimaginable scale for you and, and, and I to think of. But what it means is, the stuff that goes into the phones, the accelerometers and gyroscopes, the compasses, the screens, the proximity sensor that tells you to turn the, the screen off when you put it up to your ear, uh, all the different radios and antennas, all of that stuff, the air quality sensors and barometers that are going into the newer phones, all of that stuff gets really, really cheap because of economies of scale and manufacturing. And, and I, this is the second slide, uh, it's the second chart. I know it, I said it was going to be one more chart, uh, but I think this one's really interesting, here's why. This is a, is a silicon-based accelerometer. It detects movement, just side to side, up and down, three axes. Uh, in 2007, when it was new, it cost about $3 per chip, which is a ton of money in, in the component world. You know, if you want to put something that costs $3 on a new phone, you have to have a really, really good reason to do it. But over time, they started adding these to iPhones and Android phones and all the other smartphones. And the price went down. It started at $3. In 2010, it cost 65 cents each. And in 2015, you can buy them for about a dime each. Price is going to continue going down. Uh, this, this brings us to spin-offs. So spin-offs, this is one of my favorite, favorite things in the world. When I was a kid, and, and they still do it today, NASA would release this magazine every year called Spin-offs. And it basically contains all of the interesting technologies that have that existed because of NASA space research that benefit us here on Earth. So in the beginning, that was stuff like Velcro and smoke detectors. Uh, these days, it's things like better ways to make carbon nanotubes and more efficient ways to build solar panels so they can tap more energy density into them. Uh, but never, ever, in any circumstances, was tame in this magazine. Most of you probably don't know what Tang is. This is a joke for all the old people in the audience. Um, Tang, I've been told by NASA, Tang has never been in space, at least in an official capacity. So, um, smartphones, it turns out, are responsible for lots of spin-offs. Um, and we're going to talk about some of them now. This is a, autonomous vehicles. This is a UAV, a drone, a quadcopter, whatever you want to call it. There's a million of them here. They're crashing them over there. They're racing them over there. They're taking pictures probably over there someplace, but I'm sure somebody's doing something cool I've never heard of someplace else. But they're revolutionizing aerial photography and cartography and fire, firefighting and search and rescue. And people are even using them to track uh, methane leaks, gas, carbon, uh, uh, greenhouse gas leaks, and oil fields. Uh, these exist because they're essentially smartphones where you take the screen off and you swap it for a really big battery and some motors and some propellers and a couple other pieces of hardware we don't need to talk about. Uh, this is a self-driving car. 
the sort of Google self-driving cars. And the sensors in here exist because of smartphones. They're, they're phones that are, they're sensors that are inexpensive and spun off of smartphones. But even more importantly, the data that makes this thing work, the data about where roads are, and what roads are closed, and what roads are open at any given moment, where the sidewalks are, the thing that, and there's a bunch of stuff that keeps us from driving on the sidewalk. But one of the things that keeps us from driving on the sidewalk is that Google's been collecting data about where the sidewalks are from our phones for the last 10 years. It turns out it's a really useful thing. Uh, this is the open ROV. You can see this here, too. It's over by the dark room. And it's an underwater drone. It, uh, it uses off-the-shelf hardware, it's relatively expensive, but you can add your own sensor packages to it, and, and researchers are using this in really interesting ways, because they're used to paying tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars for this type of equipment. Uh, the open RV, I think, costs around a grand, so it's almost, but not quite disposable, depending on what you're doing, and you can customize it to do what you want. Again, smartphone technology packaged in a new and an interesting way. Uh, I could literally talk for an entire 25 minutes about robots. Uh, this is the Boston Dynamics Atlas robot. It's their test bed for bipedal robot design. So you walking like, like you and I do every day. Um, all the a lot of the sensors, a lot of the electronics that make it work come from phones. This is a Tesla. It's an electric car. Here's something you may or may not know about Teslas. The lithium-ion batteries that make the Tesla and the lithium and all the other electric cars work. It's essentially the same as a battery in your laptop or your phone. It's just a lot bigger and a little bit different chemistry because the cars have different needs than the phones. So how do you use this knowledge to predict the future? Well, let me tell you one more story. In 2000, in the early 2000s, Google realized that the price of hard drive storage per megabyte was trending towards zero. So it's going down the same way that that memory graph did a little while ago. And they started building services based on the assumption that eventually it was going to cost nothing to store data online in the cloud. So on April 1, 2004, they launched a service that, quite frankly, as somebody in the tech press, it was kind of hard to believe it was real. Um, and it wasn't the Google Moon Day, so that was actually the April Fool's joke that year. Uh, it was this, Gmail. 2004, Gmail launched with a gigabyte of storage per person. Now, at that time, Hotmail and Yahoo, or the other two web mail providers, were offering, I think, two to four megabytes per user for free accounts. So on one hand, you have two megabytes. On the other hand, you have a thousand megabytes. It was a pretty smart difference. They did pretty well with it. And they were able to do that because they knew, even though that storage was expensive in 2004, by 2009 or 2010, it was going to cost them virtually nothing give people you know, a gigabyte would be an inconsequential amount of space. Uh, the same thing is happening right now with compute. Well, what's compute? Compute is the ability to do math online in the cloud. Uh, this is an NVIDIA uh, DGX1. It's a brand new machine. It basically uses video cards that people use to play games uh, to do math online in its real farms. And what's happening is it's trending the price of compute, the ability to do math online towards zero. Uh, this is why we're seeing advances in things like neural networks and AI and, and all that kind of exciting stuff. So how does this uh, apply to smartphones? I can't remember what the slide was for now, actually. It's <laughs> fast forward. Oh, okay. We're going to make an exciting finish. Um, so how does this let you predict the future? Well, you look at the stuff that's in phones, and in the devices and services that are incredibly popular. And you look and you trim that stuff out and you see when it's going to cost nothing. Like, is it going to be three years, is it going to be five years, is it going to be ten years? You figure out how to take advantage of the components that are going into phones this year that are going to cost practically nothing in five or six years. And you start building stuff based around the knowledge that that's, that's going to happen. Because when Apple and Samsung and Google stand up on stages and say, okay, here's this new, really cool, expensive air quality sensor we're putting in all of our phones next year. That may cost four or five, ten dollars, whatever it costs now. But you know that because of economies of scale, because there's two billion phones in the world, in a few years, those expensive chips are going to go from three or five dollars to sixty cents to ten cents to practically nothing. Uh, the same thing's going to happen with computers in the cloud. What costs a ton of money today is going to cost nothing. If you build services for that now, it will exist in the future. Case in point, virtual reality. Virtual reality exists because screens, accelerometers, gyroscopes all got cheap because of smartphones. That, that's what you can laugh, it's a funny picture. Um, those, this, is, this is the perfect example of this technology happening, of this process happening. As, you know, without 
the smartphones and accelerators, accelerometers and gyroscopes that drove the cost of these components down. We literally would not have been in a position where you could spend three hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, six hundred dollars to get a VR headset today. Um, we'd still be in the same boat that we were ten or fifteen years ago, where VR headsets were something that the military made to train fighter pilots that cost millions of dollars each. So uh, that's it for me today. Go out and build stuff. Know that you can see the future. Uh, thank you so much. If you want to know more, you can find out about my VR company at Foo VR. Um, and I don't know how much time we have left, but if we have some time, I can take some questions. Thanks. We have some time. Thank you guys so much and have fun at Maker Faire.